Greetings to God's people from the sanctuary of St. Matthew's Church in Glendale, California, on this second Sunday in Easter. Let us pray. God of justice and peace, so often we have found ourselves in circumstances that would call us to stand firm and give witness of your mercy and grace, but we were silent. Too often we have even sought to avoid being called upon to witness for you so we might not be openly embarrassed by sharing our faith. Forgive us and lead us to those who need to hear of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. During the Easter season, we play in the mystery of Jesus' presence, mostly through the glorious gospel of St. John. Today, we gather with the disciples on the first Easter, and Jesus breathes the Spirit on us. With Thomas, we ask for a sign, and Jesus offers us his wounded self here today. From frightened individuals, we are transformed into a community of peace, forgiveness, and sharing such that no one among us shall be in need. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been offered for us. Let us then rejoice by putting away all malice and evil, and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you feed us with living bread. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God looks upon us with mercy, and by water and the word joins us to the saving death of Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, God raises us with Jesus to new life. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The risen Jesus came and stood among his followers and said, Peace be with you. Then they were glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the risen Jesus be with you always, and also with you. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. The grace of our risen Savior, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the day of Jesus' resurrection. By the grace of Jesus among us, enable us to show the power of the resurrection in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the council to be questioned by the high priest. He said to them, We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. You are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed. God raised him to his right hand as leader and savior to bring repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to this thing and to the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so. Amen. Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Christ. When it was evening on the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. I have to admit that I absolutely love this Sunday. I love the first Sunday after the big Easter celebration because we get Thomas and his doubts. The question that I always have, though, is, where in God's green earth was Thomas? Why was he not there with the rest of the disciples? You see, what happened is that all of Jesus' disciples managed to scatter. Jesus had just been put to death, a death that we right now cannot really fully understand because crucifixion was the lowest of the lowest form of being put to death. And so all the men got up and left. They ran from Jerusalem and thank God for those faithful women who stayed through the end. More on that later. <laughs> it's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> but all the men left and they are in this upper room somewhere with the doors locked for fear that they are going to get arrested and that they will soon take the same fate that Jesus had. And so they're gathered in this room, and the door is locked, and suddenly Jesus shows up in the room and says to them, peace be with you. I love how they clean up the gospel. The word, word really is not peace be with you. It's a familiar phrase that you know only too well. His first words to them is, do not be afraid. Now, if you were in a room with a door locked and a dead relative of yours showed up and I suspect the first thing they're going to have to say to you is, uh, don't be afraid, which usually means you're going to be afraid. But here they are and he's standing there in the midst of them and he says to them, peace be with you. And he tells them, you know, if you forgive anybody, you will be forgiven. And if you retain something, it'll be retained in heaven. But Thomas was not there. I imagine that Thomas was probably at home sleeping. His alarm didn't go off that morning, so he didn't quite make it. But when the disciples heard this good news, when they found that Jesus was alive, you do what you do with good news. You go tell everybody, hey, look, Jesus is alive. And you can hear Thomas going, yeah, I don't think so. Unless I put my fingers where he was crucified and where they pierce, pierced him, I am not going to believe you. And the disciples, the rest of the disciples, I imagine, are saying, but no, 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 he came into the room, the doors were locked, and he showed up. And Thomas probably said something along the lines of, it's kind of early in the morning, are you sure you should be in the wine so quickly? But he says... What I think most of us would say if somebody told us that a relative of ours was still alive who we had thought was dead, he said, unless I can see it for myself, I am not going to believe. 
It's kind of like that movie, you know, show me the money. <laughs> show me the Messiah. <laughs> show me the wounds. Let me see physically that he is alive and there. And so the next week, they do what they do. They're up in a room again, doors locked, everything is okay, and Jesus suddenly shows up again and goes, peace be with you. Surprise. <laughs> do not be afraid. But this time, Thomas is there. And Jesus calls him up and says, okay, Thomas, you want proof? Here it is. Come put your hands in the nails. Come put your hand in my side to see that it really is me. And I love the fact the gospel does not say that Thomas went and did it. He doesn't go up to talk to Jesus. He doesn't go to check. He just sees Jesus. Now, again, if one of your relatives had died and suddenly showed up in a room, are you pretty keen to go touch them? Probably not. <laughs> but Thomas, I think, gets a bad rap. I think we keep thinking that doubt is something bad when it comes to matters of faith. So let me correct something. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is an important part of having faith. The opposite of faith is absolute certainty. And here's what I mean by that. When you're absolutely sure who God is going to smite, who is in heaven and who is not, when you are sure that this is how God works, you leave no room for faith. Because faith is lending your heart to something that may not be physically possible, but tells us a much deeper truth. And that is what Thomas was looking for. Thomas is looking for a deeper truth beyond the actual proof in front of him. And the thing is, if we are honest with ourselves, we are Thomas. So here's a question that will prove that you're Thomas. Have you ever gotten a phone call where the news was so good that you couldn't believe it? When you get that phone call that says you're going to be a parent or a grandparent, or the doctor calls and says, you're cancer-free, or your medical bills have all been paid, your first response is not, yay. Your first response is, I don't believe it. I remember hearing when I was going to be a uh, an uncle for the very first time. My brother and his wife had been trying to have kids, and nothing seemed to have been working, and finally he called and said, you are going to be an uncle. And I almost asked, did you buy a new monkey? <laughs> um, but he, he called to tell me that you're going to be an uncle, and the only thing that I could say was, you're kidding. You're joking, right? It's like, no, 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 you really are going to be an uncle. <laughs> you see, when we hear that good news, when we hear one of our family members calls and tells us something that is so good that we cannot fathom it, our first response is doubt. We don't believe it. We have to be convinced. And the same is true for faith. Faith is not something that we just get a certain amount of it and it stays with us for the rest of our lives. It ebbs and it flows. There are days that we are so full with God that we are just overflowing and there are days it feels like the cup is dry. And that's okay. One of my professors in seminary was fond of saying, you know, it's okay to have a fifth grade understanding of God when you're in the fifth grade. Because our understanding, our faith must change and evolve and develop as we grow. The faith that we have at 70 is not the faith we had at seven. For good reason. And so our faith is not intended to be stagnant. Our faith is something that grows and ebbs and flows and allows us to doubt, to disbelieve, because it means that we are struggling with those matters of the heart and not of the head. The famous theologian Frederick Buechner said that doubt is the ants in the pants that keeps faith alive. And I think he's right. A healthy dose of doubt helps our faith to grow. It means that we are allowed to put away those things that no longer sustain us. 
those things that no longer bring us close to God, to let something new grow in its place. You see, Thomas gets a bad rap because many times we are not willing to admit that we have doubts and fears. But Jesus stands in the midst of the locked doors that we create and always says to us, peace be with you. Do not be afraid. The thing about fear is that fear is a liar. It always lies. It always tells us that we are not good enough, that this is not good enough for you, that you do not deserve it. And we know that in Jesus Christ, perfect love casts out fear, not kicks it out, not puts it out, but casts it out. And for us, a healthy dose of that doubt that allows us to put our fears to the side means that we get to follow a Jesus who will not ever let us go, who will not let us stay in that place of fear and hiding behind locked doors, a faith that says that I will break through every single locked door to find you and to set you free. Love frees us. Love opens us. Love allows us to let our fears go to the side that we may find faith. And even in the midst of those moments of deep doubt and disbelief, God is still present, calling us to something new and different and faithful. Because when we encounter that risen Christ, when he breaks through the locked doors that we create, when we find that doubt is an absolute necessity in our life of faith, all we can do like Thomas is say, my Lord and my God. Amen. Let us pray. Made alive in Jesus and filled with Jesus' spirit, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of God's creation. Ever living God, you awaken faith amidst our doubts and fears. Reveal your presence so that we recognize your power at work in your church and throughout the world. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy Creator, the earth receives your promise of new life. Seeds die to bear fruit, and plants decay to nourish the soil. Restore all living things as you intend. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. Giver of peace. When you make your presence known, you do so by offering peace. Bring such peace to peoples and nations ravaged by war, violence, and natural disaster. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you breathe hope into rooms of despair. Be with the sick, the lonely, the grieving, and those in any need. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. God of welcome, 
You are with the peoples of St. Matthew's Church and Armenian Evangelical Brethren Church as we worship in this place. Bless all those who God draws to these communities and let them know the touch of your embrace. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. God of life, with you all things are possible. With the saints, especially Matthew and Martin, make us live in hope, trusting that though we do not see, we believe. Receive our prayer, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers, merciful God, and dwell in us richly through Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O God of our salvation, you have restored us to life. You have brought us back again into your love. By the resurrection of Jesus, continue to heal us as we go to live and work in the power of your Spirit. Amen. God, who through the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ has given us the victory, give you joy and peace in your faith and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.